and get started. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We're really excited about this conversation. So tonight is Ask the Author and we're talking about Arizona's Cold War with uh, Jason Gart. And so he is gonna speak to you all in just a few minutes. We're just gonna introduce the Arizona Historical Society before that happens. So tonight on this call, in addition to our, our guest, you're gonna see Dr. David Turpy. He's gonna be our moderator for this evening. And then also Dr. Laura Key is gonna be letting you in and assisting you if you have any problems. And then my name is Shannon Fleischman and I'm the curator at the Arizona Heritage Center. So just a little bit about the Arizona Historical so Society is we're actually a pretty old society. So we were uh, the first historical agency established in Arizona and we have four locations across the state located in Yuma, Flagstaff, Tempe, and Tucson. And we are um, operating under one common mission, and that is to connect people through the power of Arizona's history. And so this talk tonight actually plays to that mission that we're trying to connect you all a little bit deeper to the, uh, the role that Arizona played in the Cold War. So you'll get a little bit deeper understanding on this. But these are the kind of programs and exhibitions that we're striving to put forward to make sure that everybody gets a little bit deeper understanding of Arizona's history every time you come to one of our programs or exhibitions. And um, I, if you follow us on social media, you're gonna see that we uh, just came out with our new license plate with the uh, MVD, which is super cool. And it has our copper logo, which you can also see on my virtual background behind us. But it has uh, the photoscape of the monsoon season because we know that that is like quintessential Arizona. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get as much of it last year. So we're hoping that putting the license plate out this year, we're going to get more of it. We're, we're speaking it into the, <laughs> into the universe there. Um, so this is a great way to support us. If you go and get one of these license plates, we get some of the funds and you continue to help us put on programs like this and show your Arizona history pride. Um, and we have two locations that are open for our museums. Uh, the Arizona History Museum located in Tucson and the Arizona Heritage Center located in Tempe. And both locations are open from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, Tuesday through Saturday. And you can find your tickets at azhs.org backslash tickets. And some of the exhibit highlights we have um, down in our Tucson Museum, we have Barry Goldwater's huge, huge desk, which um, this exhibition looks at more of the man rather than the politician. And it shows his interest in like AV radios and you see his handmade um, radio set and this gigantic desk and some of his photographs that he's taken. So we're trying to add some, um, some deeper knowledge of, of Barry Goldwater uh, beyond his role in, in his political career. And then in our uh, Tempe location, we have an exhibit called Still Marching from Suffrage to the Hashtag Me Too Movement, which looks at women-led uh, organizations and movements in Arizona's history and celebrates the 100-year anniversary of suffrage. Um, upcoming programs we have, we have next week uh, is a uh, conversation that's a continuation of the Water Talks and it looks at um, how some mural artists are uh, celebrating Arizona's like water and natural history. And then we have a, a talk in two weeks that's on Sun City and looks at our like kind of place in the West of being one of the retirement capitals of, of you know, the world and that being Sun City and how the city was really developed with the retirees in mind. And then finally, in three weeks, we have a um, partnership uh, program that looks at the Smithsonian's collection on women in aerospace and engineering and or astronauts. And this is kind of a sneak peek preview to an exhibit that we have opening in, in Tempe, or excuse me, in our uh, Tucson location, which is gonna look at Arizona's role in space. So as a sneak peek for that exhibit, we're encouraging you to, to join that program on March 17th. And then lastly, I just wanna talk about um, our membership. So our members really drive what we do and are the way that we connect with all of you. And it's not just you connecting with us, but we also 
give you a, a good deal for being a member. So you get um, free membership, you get a discount, but one of the best things is you get access to our Journal of Arizona History. And David and Laura, who are on this call, I have to shout out a phenomenal job that they're doing on the journal. We just had a double issue that's been shouted out with it. a lot of really recognized historians and Western historians on, on the scholarship that's being put together in this journal. And so as a member, you not only get access to the current issues, but all the digital access to past issues. So just want to shout that out that you can have access to a phenomenal amount of Arizona's history by just joining. And you can find all of this information at azhs.gov. Oh, .org. So if you have any other questions, you can find us on our website. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over the conversation to, to David. And uh, if you Lastly, just really quick, if you have any questions or comments, if you could please use the chat box and we will get to the questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Shannon. That was a, a great introduction uh, and thanks for the complimenting the journal. I, I, we appreciate it. Um, we're very pleased to welcome a, a recent uh, journal author uh, who's here with us tonight, Jason Gart. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Jason is the Vice President and Director of Litigation Research at History Associates Incorporated in Rockville, Maryland, where he manages the day-to-day -day operations of the Research and Analysis Service Line, which provides customized historical research data and analysis for corporate and government clients. Jason has successfully directed upward of 200 historical research investigations, including multiple high-profile assignments for Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 companies. His areas of expertise include historical research methods, business and institutional history, environmental history, World War II and Cold War mobilization, and the history of science and technology. Jason is currently one of 10 non-governmental members appointed to the Federal Freedom of Information Act Advisory Committee chartered in 2014 by the National Archives, the FOIA Advisory Committee serves as a deliberative body to foster dialogue between the federal government and the requester community, solicit public comments and develop recommendations for improving FOIA administration uh, and proactive disclosures. Jason graduated cum laude with a BS in history and politics from Drexel University and received an MA in public history and a PhD in history from Arizona State University, where he studied under public history pioneer, Noel Stowe. Uh, and of course, Jason is, um, as I mentioned, a, a recent author. He published an article in the Journal of Arizona History uh, in the autumn 2019 issue called The Defense Establishment in Cold War, Arizona, 1945 to 1968. Uh, the article is, um, uh, currently available for free on Project Muse. I will um, post the link to that in the chat in just a minute. So um, if you haven't read it already, please check it out uh, when you have a chance. It'll be uh, available for free through the end of March. Uh, so without further ado, I'll let Jason take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening from Washington, DC. Um, hopefully you do not hold that against me. Having lived in Arizona for almost 12 years, um, I have a great fondness for the state and I expect that you all are enjoying some fabulous weather right now. And thank you, David. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Laura. I'm very excited about the opportunity to talk, to talk tonight about Arizona's Cold War, a topic of investigation, which I believe is still neglected by historians and scholars. Before I get started, I do need to say that I am not speaking for History Associates Incorporated, its employees or its shareholders. These are my views and opinions only and do not represent the views of my company or my colleagues. Let's begin our journey approximately 60 years ago in the late 1950s and early 1960s when Arizona was under the radar. Military aircraft, Bailed to Goodyear Aircraft Corporation, located in Litchfield Park, Arizona, and equipped with an exotic and highly classified aerial reconnaissance system known as synthetic aperture radar, 
spent innumerable hours in the clear skies above the state. Unlike conventional aerial photography, which was highly dependent on weather, this aerial reconnaissance platform utilized radar sensors, relying on the frequency changes created by the Doppler effect. The invention would eventually prove transformative for the US intelligence agencies and would be deployed in both the U-2 and SR-71 spy planes, among many other aircraft, enabling the collection of all weather imagery by penetrating clouds, fog, rain, snow, and even battlefield con conditions such as smoke, dust, and camouflage. In the quest to perfect this new technology, Goodyear aircraft researchers generated hundreds, possibly thousands of radar images of Arizona. Interesting, it was the urban nature of the region that most int interested the engineers. Man-made structures such as manufacturing plants, railroad depots, hydroelectric dams, irrigated farms, commercial airfields, and the highway system, which no doubt were similar to those found in the Soviet Union or the People's Republic of China, had more, had, had more appeal than any Arizona mountain, desert, or canyon. Between 1958 and 1961, we know that, air, that Goodyear aircraft conducted at least 18 radar recording missions over the Phoenix metropolitan area and four flights over Tucson. In addition, comprehensive radar flights were made, from, made of other Arizona towns, including Mesa, Prescott, Wilcox, and Yuma. For a population that prided itself on privacy and limited government intervention, the news that Goodyear aircraft was secretly utilizing Arizona cities as its private research laboratory would have come as a great surprise. Indeed, although one picture of Goodyear Phoenix was released by military officials in August 1959, it would not be, it would not be until the early 1970s that synthetic aperture radar systems and the bulk of the radar imagery would be publicly revealed. For Arizonians who intermittently came in con into contact with the Goodyear aircraft engineers who were conducting the radar experiments, the experience could be puzzling and sometimes frightening. When triangle-shaped metal markers that helped gauge radar accuracy were placed on a farm near Buckeye, Arizona, the property owner worried that, quote, secret waves would kill his crops and turn the ground into no man's land of infertility. Most importantly, however, synthetic aperture radar was one of several remarkable technologies developed in Arizona between 1945 and 1968 a crucial period in the history of the state, when a significant numbers of electronics and aerospace firms established manufacturing and production facilities in Arizona. Indeed, this 23 year period saw the emergence of the state's, emergence of the state's unique post-war defense establishment, an array of interconnected military installations, proving grounds, corporate research laboratories, industrial testing facilities, and airframe and missile production facilities that transferred Arizona into both a battleground and home front of the Cold War. My argument, plainly stated, is that the US defense needs brought profound changes to Arizona to the Cold War and contributed to fundamental transformations in the state, on par at least with the substantial impact of the Second World War. Cold War Arizona most, was most clearly a creation of the Korean War. This conflict, which lasted from June 1950 to July 1953, brought extensive transformations to Arizona military installations. In Tucson, davis Mothin Air Force Base became a strategic air command installation and was protected by two Nike Hercules surface-to-air missile batteries. In Glendale, Luke Air Force Base was reactivated as a training center for fighter pilots. Williams Air Force Base near Mesa trained undergraduate pilots, while Navajo Ordnance Depot loc 12, located 12 miles west of Flagstaff, became an important demilitarization center for outdated or unserviceable conventional or chemical weapons. As the Cold War advanced, Arizona became part of a broader militarized region of test sites and proving grounds that extended across the West. The Nevada test site northwest of Las Vegas was the location of approximately 100 above ground or atmospheric nuclear tests between 1951 and 1963. White Sands Proving Ground, later White Sands Missile Range, east of La Cruces, New Mexico, became the principal overland rocket and guided missile testing center for the United States. Less well-known, but just as strategic, was the US, US Army Electronic Proving Ground at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Located in Southern Arizona, 
Huachuca's origins date to the Indian Wars of the late 19th century. In February 1954, Fort Huachuca was reactivated as an electronic proving ground under the command of the Chief Signal Officer of the Department of Army. The installation, which replaced the congested proving grounds at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, offered an isolated setting with relative lack of radio interference. Spanning, the nearly seven, spanning nearly 70 thousand acres and including secondary test sites near Gila Bend and in Tucson, Fort Wauchuca's mission was to test and evaluate new electronic systems for warfighters. Researchers at Fort Wauchuca focused on a variety of technical issues, field testing early unmanned surveillance drones, developing electronic warfare techniques, including electronic countermeasures and electronic counter countermeasures. There is such a thing and managing after 1967 the secure global hotline between the United States and the Soviet Union. Arizona defense installations also played a vital role in the distribution of military assistance to foreign governments. The creation of NATO in April 1949 aligned the United States with the defense of Western Europe. The Mutual Defense Assistance Act of 1949, which became law shortly thereafter, offered us Alliance members military assistance in the form of equipment, materials, and services. The Truman administration, hoping to contain the spread of communism, extended United States military aid to other nations, both, both for hemispheric defense and for internal security. Arizona installations, including the US Naval Air Facility Litchfield Park and Davis Monthan Air Force Base, which had served as storage facilities for obsolete and reserve aircraft in the immediate immediate post-war years, were quickly transformed into refurbishment and modification centers. Arizona's unique low humidity climate and close proximity to Latin America meant that, meant that, uh, uh, meant that well-preserved aircraft with limited overhaul needs could be inexpensively transported or in some cases flown directly to foreign governments. Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, Thousands of military aircraft from Litchfield and Davis Mountain were sold abroad to Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Denmark, France, Honduras, Japan, the Netherlands, Portugal, and Uruguay. Yugoslavia in particular became an important recipient of military assistance and planes from Arizona. Pentagon defense planners who desired to keep Yugoslavia independent from Moscow provided extensive aid to Marshal Tito's regime. Between 1950 and 1955, the country received 260 Thunderjet aircraft from NDAP, many from Davis Moth and Air Force Base. Mutual assistance obligations also brought not a large number of foreign nationals to Arizona. For military training, beginning in 1957, military pilots from West Germany received flight instruction at Luke Air Force Base. In 1958 and in 1959, military personnel from, the, personnel from the United Kingdom attended the Thor Missile School at Douglas Air Fra Aircraft Company in Tucson. During the 1960s, Williams Air Force Base trained military pilots and ground crews from Canada, Iran, Norway, the Philippines, South Korea, South Vietnam, Thailand, and Turkey. Several of the students were also foreign dignitaries. For example, in 1964, the nephew, nephew of King Faisal, uh, Faisal of Saudi Arabia was stationed at Williams Air Force Base in preparation for his assumption of duties in the Royal Saudi Arabian Air Force. Cold War Arizona also served as an important clandestine, clandestine location for the Central Intelligence Agency. Throughout the 1960s, Arizona was both a staging ground and embarkation point for a host of covert operations including intelligence gathering, insurgency training, and paramilitary support. Arizona's relationship with the CIA was forged in the aftermath of the failed April 1961 invasion of Cuba at Bay of Pigs. They attempted to depose Fidel Castro by CIA-trained Cuban exiles, brought wide-ranging rebuke, and led to extensive restructuring within the agency, with a particular emphasis placed on increasing the number of CIA air proprietaries. First developed in 1950 by Lawrence R. Houston, the CIA general counsel, air proprietaries were CIA created and controlled business entities. 
such as aviation companies and commercial airlines, which proved cover and support for covert operations and the performance of other tasks. As part of this expansion, Intermountain Aviation Inc. was established in Arizona in September 1961. Located on East Buckeye Road in Phoenix, the company described itself publicly as a, as a quote, aircraft charter and rental service company. In reality, Intermountain was part of the Special Operations Division of CIA's Air Branch. In early 1962, Intermountain moved to Marana Air Park a deactivated military base situated 28 miles northwest of Tucson. With upward of $2 million in assets and a cadre of CIA employees, including aircraft conversion experts, aerial delivery technicians, paramilitary specialists, master parachutists, and pilots, Intermountain began a host of clandestine assignments. Between May and June 1962, the company provided logistical support for Project Kofi, an Office of Naval Research, ONR, mission to an abandoned Soviet research station in the Arctic. Intermountain deployed a sophisticated aerial retrieval system known as the Fulton Skyhook, which enabled ONR personnel and discarded Russian equipment to be lifted from the ground to an airborne B-17 aircraft. Intermountain also provided operational support for the secret war in Northern Laos. During the summer of 1962, Marana Air Park served as a training facility for CIA case officers, assisting in the insurgency campaign against the North Vietnamese. Intermountain offered instruction on low-level parachute drops and pilot certification for short takeoff and landing aircraft. Intermountain also played a vital role in Tibet, the country which had been invaded by China in October 1950 and whose spiritual leader, leader, the Dalai Lama, had fled into exile in March of 1959, was, was, was the location of a CIA-backed covert war. Between 1963 and 1965, Intermountain provided transport for Tibet, Tibetan resistance, flying paramilitary forces via India and Nepal to an agency training base near Leadville, Colorado. These defense needs drove Arizona's post-war economic expansion. During the 1950s and 1960s, numerous defense-related manufacturing production facilities were established in Arizona. These new firms were drawn to Arizona by, federal, by the federal government's dispersion and decentralization policy. Dispersion and decentralization, which had been used selectively during the Second World War, removed vital defense industries from the country's borders and seacoast and scattered them inland to avoid the creation of concentrated objectives for enemy bombers. In 1951, the Truman administration established a limited dispersion program attended to safeguard industrial facilities from nuclear attack. Focused on the location of future industry rather than, existing, than the existing production base, the policy mandated that new defense plants be at least 10 miles from a potential target. With the surprise Soviet detonation of the hydrogen bomb in August of 53, regional dispersion of key industrial manufacturing was again urged by military planners. Harold Talbot, who served as the Secretary of the Air Force between February 53 and August of 1953, became a particularly enthusiastic supporter of dispersion. In April 1955, he ordered via military directive the dispersal of future airline, airplane and guided missile facilities inland and away from the west and east coast. In Arizona, dispersion served as a unique competitive advantage as both small and large communities attracted relocating defense firms. In 1957, officials at the Arizona Air Procurement District, a liaison office of the Department of Air Force, reported that between 1948 and 1956, more than 200 new companies moved into or were activated in Phoenix alone. A textbook example of how this process worked is found in Tucson and the arrival of Hughes Aircraft Company from Culver City, California in the early 1950s. Hughes Aircraft had been founded in early 1938 as a division of Hughes Tool Company, a company controlled by Howard Hughes. Yes, that Howard Hughes. The enigmatic film producer, aviator, and industrialist. Whose aircraft served as a valuable yet somewhat vexing defense contractor during World War II, but soon became an early player in an emerging field of guided missile research. 
In January 1945, the company received U.S. Army Air Force con uh, U.S. Army Air Force contract focused on reverse engineering the German V-1 buzz bomb. To meet this and other high-profile projects, Hughes hired Dr. Simon Ramel and Dr. Dean Wooldridge, two brilliant scientists, and Ira Eaker and Harold George, two former U.S. Air Force generals. By February of 1950, Hughes Aircraft had developed and engineered a remarkable missile. Known informally as the MX-904 air-to-air -air missile, the weapon was officially designated GAR-1, Guided Air Rocket 1, or the Falcon. Constructed of phenolic plastic and reinforced with glass fiber, the tubular-shaped Falcon was six feet long, six inches diameter, and weighed only 124 pounds. Designed to intercept subsonic bombers at a range of five miles, the missile was powered by a solid propellant rocket motor, another innovation. Unlike rockets used during the Second World War, the Falcon incorporated a unique semi-active radar system that utilized launching aircraft's radar to guide the missile to target destruction. Unfortunately, the location of this engineering marvel soon worried defense planners. Military officials viewed the Falcon program, which was one of only three US Air Force missile, missiles in development as particularly strategic. Production schedules for 1951, for instance, anticipated the manufacture of several hundred missiles per month. Within whose aircraft, managers were also raising locational concerns. On June 28, 1950, just three days after the Korean War started, company officials became convinced that Southern California was a strategic hazard and authorized the search for an inland facility for the production of the missile. Between September and December of 1950, company representatives in consultation with military officials surveyed several facilities in Salt Lake City, Missouri, Michigan, New and New Orleans. When no suitable location was found, the company organized a tour of the South Southwest, inviting, among others, Rory Drachman, a real estate developer from Tucson. Company officials initially settled on a location in Phoenix, but inflated property values and Drachman's quote, boosterism soon steered attention towards Tucson. In February of 1951, Hughes announced the construction of a 545,000 square foot guided missile facility on 2,500 acres adjoining the Tucson Municipal Airport. Hughes, who had made several monthly Howard Hughes, who had made several monthly visits to Arizona during the 1940s, shrewdly, shrewdly realized that the company could have a powerful influence in the state. The new plant was a massive structure built by Dell Webb Construction Company, the one-story building, which was, was made of fabricated structural steel and cost nearly $7.3 million. And it contained 13 acres of floor space. By the mid-1950s, the assembly lines at the facility, which was now known as U.S. Air Force Plant 44, were producing approximately 200 Falcon missiles per week, or five every hour. America's burgeoning defense established did not go unnoticed to the Soviet Union. Indeed, in October 1961, U.S. Air Force officials in the Phoenix Air Force Contract Management District discovered that the Soviets had contacted the Phoenix offices of the Nuclear Corporation of America an attempt to request information on rare earth metals used in one of its products. An important defense subcontractor with expertise in advanced materials research, Nuclear Corporation of America manufactured a range of specialized items, including diodes, capacitors, rare earth metals, oxides, and salts. Although the company declined to provide information to the Soviets and immediately contacted US Air Force officials, the incident served as an apt warning. Shortly thereafter, the Department of State, in consultation with the Department of Defense and the Department of Justice, determined that the city of Phoenix would be closed to visitors, to, would be closed to visits by Soviet citizens in order to protect, quote, the internal security of the United States of America. Throughout the Cold War, Arizona endeavored to make itself attractive to the defense establishment. To this end, political and economic elites were extremely conscious of creating an inviting and friendly business climate in the state. Electronics and aerospace firms were especially courted. Arizona boosters soon found themselves, however, in direct competition with a host of other regions and locales. At the forefront was California's San Francisco Peninsula, notably Palo Alto. 
while other cities soon entered the fray, including Portland and Seattle, as well as Albuquerque, Austin, Dallas, and Houston. As one Texas booster declared, quote, the footloose quality of the industry enables manufacturers to evaluate all sections of the country and then locate their operations anywhere that conditions are most advantageous. Within this competitive landscape, Arizona utilized an array of political and economic incentives to attract the defense establishment. For example, during the early 1950s, business and civic leaders initiated massive overhaul of the tax system to help attract electronics and aerospace firms. As part of the effort, the state legislature eliminated taxes on manufacturing inventories, lowered assessment rates for machinery and equipment, and provided tax exemptions for warehouse good, goods. When Sperry Rand Corporation expressed misgivings about Arizona sales tax on sales to the federal government in December of 1955, the legislator quickly intervened to repeal the law. Indeed, retired General Douglas MacArthur, yes, that Douglas MacArthur, who served as chairman of the board of Sperry Rand, later described booster efforts by the city as both as mutually beneficial to both city and the company. Most electronics and aerospace firms returned the favor by becoming prominent Arizona boosters. Company literature often highlighted the state's family paradise climate, its unlimited, unlimited recreation facilities. Potential employees learned of Scottsdale, Scottsdale's swank, swank resorts, its exotic restaurants and its night spots. Company exec, executives often boasted of their swimming pools and their golf handicaps. As a result, electronic and aeros aerospace firms formed an important link between Arizona and the larger scientific and engineering community. One Motorola executive exec off, often joked that the East, quote, is a nice place to visit, especially since one can meet so many brilliant young men and convince them that they would be much happier living and working in the West. Defense firms often emerge as important spokespersons for Arizona education issues. Beginning in the mid 1950s, Motorola lobbied first privately and then publicly for an expansion of the state's higher education system. Specifically, the firm sought to establish, sought the establishment of an engineering degree program at Arizona State College, now Arizona State University at Tempe. The creation of Arizona State College's bachelor degree in engineering in 1956 and its school of engineering in 1958 were a direct result of their, their efforts. City planning and urban architecture were also transformed by the newly arrived electronics and aerospace firms. As early as 1936, Motorola sought to locate its manufacturing facilities in residential neighborhoods that were far removed from inner city congestion. Motorola continued this land use pattern when it arrived in Arizona. The Motorola Research Laboratory, which was constructed in 1949, was built adjacent to the Arizona Country Club in an attractive northeastern residential area of Phoenix. The sem their semiconductors product division park, plant, excuse me, which opened in 1957, was located across Papago Park, a national monument turned municipal park. Their Western Military Electronics Center neighbored the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Reservation. At the same time, Motorola executives sought architecture that, quote, would be identified more re readily with a museum or educational institution rather than a factory. The Motorola Research Laboratory, for example, utilized Mayan symbols as decorative motifs. The Western Military Electron Electronics Center was in the international style of architecture. Many other plants became well known for their campus-like setting, which included landscape lawns, recessed buildings, underground utility lines, and ample employee parking. The defense establishment also brought subtle and often unforeseen challenge changes to Arizona's post-war society. During the 1950s and 1960s, the state emerged as a prominent stronghold of anti-communism and later ultra-conservatism. Arizona, which had consistently voted democratic during the first half of the 20th century, turned red after 1952. Newly settled defense contractors were important agents in this political reversal. A well-respected and influential class, Arizona's defense established became persistent critics of international communism. For, exa for example, Donald Dixon of Dixon Electronics Corporation in Scottsdale, Arizona, became a vocal critic of the Kennedy administration, ar arguing that the president had, quote, bungled along from one event to another as dictated by fate and our enemies. 
At the same time, the defense establishment is not always warmly welcomed in Arizona. Throughout the 50s and 60s, as military armament and mobilizations efforts expanded, Pentagon strategists and local res residents often clashed. One persistent criticism was noise from military aircraft. Writing to Senator Carl Hayden in May 1959, one constituent protested that, quote, daily, sometimes oftener, airplanes break the sonic barrier over Phoenix. The result each time is like a supercharged TNT exploding next to my door. Worried about the damages to his property, the constituent requested that the senator do something to restrain these, quote, speed happy airmen. Residents in Tucson, Tucson raised many of the same grievances. When the 303rd Bombardment Wing stationed in Davis Mountain Air Force Base converted from propeller driven aircraft to gas turbine or jet engine aircraft in 1953, several citizens complained through newspapers of the noise. In Douglas, members of the National Women's Christian Temperance Union accused, the U accused US Air Force pilots of bootlegging. The organization complained that military aircraft landed at Bisbee Doug Douglas International Airport, and that airmen then traveled to Mexico to buy alcoholic beverages for consumption and resale. Other Arizonans disapproved of the large military maneuvers that were intermittently held throughout the state. For example, in May 1964, the headquarters United States Strike Command of the Department of Army initiated Desert Strike, a training exercise for the US Army and the US Air Force. The joint maneuver designed to assess troop mobility and unfamiliar uh, desert terrain utilized public and private land in Arizona, California, and Nevada. Western cattle ranchers who traditionally had an ambivalent relationship with the federal government to begin with were particularly enraged. One rancher complained that the Department of Defense had sought to use patent lands at, lands at the very time when the maximum number of livestock were grazing. Citizens also looked unkindly to military measures that appeared to endanger them or their families. For example, several Tucson residents became embroiled in a contentious debate with the Department of Air Force officials in May 1960, after Davis Mountain Air Force Base was selected as a support headquarters for a Titan, later Titan II, missile complex. Deployed in reinforced underground silos, the Titan was designed to provide a second strike ICBM capability in the event of a nuclear war. Anxiety rose, however, when Tucson residents learned that the missile sites were to be located 50 miles of the 50 miles within 50 miles of the Tucson urban area. A grassroots protest movement, the Committee Against Ringing Tucson with Titans, soon organized, arguing in part that the Titan missile should be re relocated downwind, that is east of the city, to lessen the chance of atomic fallout reaching Tucson should a nuclear attack occur. Support for the movement quickly faded, however, when defense officials warned at Arizona's congressional delegation that Davis Monson Air Force Base would be deactivated if responsible citizens of Tucson continued to show a lack of enthusiasm for the, uh, for the uh, missiles. Even electronics and aerospace firms came under scrutiny. Tucsonians realized, for example, that whose aircraft could be an exasperating neighbor. In 1951, the company overwhelmed the local housing market when it became re began relocating hundreds of workers from its Culver City plant. Although the company introduced plans to build 400 rental units for its employees, uh, the development was not completed until August 1952 and home prices did not finally stabilize until mid-1953 into 1954. Tucson residents also began to resent Hughes Aircraft hiring practices. Small business owners in particular complained that the company hired away key staff. Other proprietors believed that Hughes Aircraft salaries were too inflated, and as a result, the local economy would suffer. As I conclude tonight, it's important to understand that the defense establishment was also not a panacea for Arizona. Indeed, we must be careful not to overstate the contributions of the electronics and aerospace firms and the military's role in the state. Throughout the 50s and 60s, Arizona industrial base remained, still remained grossly undeveloped in comparison to other regions of the United States. As late as 1962, a full 17 years after the Second World War, the total amount of manufacturing in Arizona was less than 3% of New York's. Arizona's economy remained marginalized in other significant ways. 
travel distance west to Los Angeles and San Diego and east to Albuquerque and El Paso were still lengthy and time consuming. Moreover, electronics and aerospace firms rarely, rarely relocated their corporate headquarters to Arizona. And like earlier business enterprises, including the three C's of copper extraction, cattle grazing, and cotton farming, or the four C's, Arizona's productive output continued to be shipped out of state. Arizona also failed to develop a mature venture capital base, or for that matter, a strong banking center. The defense industry was also in essence an urban phenomenon. Indeed, the vast majority of Arizona's rural population missed the electronics and aerospace boom. Except Motorola, which established a small operation in Vail, Arizona, post-war industrial growth was predominantly centered in either Phoenix or Tucson metropolitan areas. People of color also failed to benefit from the expansion of the defense establishment. Notably absent from the workforce were African-Americans and Mexican-Americans. Indeed, it was only after the US Air Force reaffirmed the government's non-discrimination policy in June 1962 that minority employment improved at Arizona-based electronics and aerospace firms. Even the Arizona's higher education system remained provincial. Although Phoenix and Tucson each became an oasis of scientific and technological expertise, the center of academic excellence in the West continued to be California. Arizona failed to develop a large number of private universities and colleges and relied extensively on community, community colleges. And whereas California counted 20, 22 Nobel laureates in 1962, Arizona would not have a Nobel Prize winner until 2004. We started tonight's journey 60 years ago, but let's end, to, let's end now on the morning of March 7th, 1995, when Brigadier General Vyacheslav Romanov of the Russian Federation and his team of nine inspectors arrived at the Air National Guard Station in Phoenix, Arizona. The contingent, which represented Russia, as well as the Republic of Belarus, the Republic of Kazakhstan, and the Ukraine, boarded a US Air Force bus and was immediately escorted to Camp Navajo, an Arizona National Guard installation located approximately 12 miles west of Flagstaff. The surprise on-site inspection, in which the Russian arms experts had unlimited access to the entire facility, was part of the sophisticated verification and monitoring process authorized under the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, or START-1, a multilateral arms control agreement. At Camp Navajo, one of the approximately 36 START-1 declared, start declared sites, Romanov's team examined 300 dismantled Minuteman II, Minuteman II and Trident I rocket motors, stockpiled in earthen and concrete bunkers. Speaking through an interpreter at a brief news conference, Romanov noted that the inspection was an international mission of great importance. Indeed, during the next decade, Russian arms inspectors returned intermittently to the Camp Navajo and also surveyed several other Arizona defense facilities. For Arizona, the inspections marked a symbolic end to the state's Cold War history. Yet as another period faded into the past, Arizona had transformed and the defense establishment was an important part of this legacy. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, Jason. That was uh, that was fantastic. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat yet. Uh, if anybody in the audience has uh, has questions, uh, please. Uh, uh, put them in the in the chat. Um, I'll I'll get the ball rolling. I, I have a couple uh, questions myself. Um, uh, so I guess one of the one of the questions that uh, I was thinking of um, was was there it was there anything that when you were doing your research that really just sort of surprised you or shocked you that you'd sort of uncovered this document and you thought, oh wow, you know this is this is amazing. Did anything stand out to you? I guess from from your research. Yes, uh, certainly there were there were several occasions. Um, one of the really neat things about um, the project was I, I did a substantial number of oral interviews. Um, so I was able to um, um, meet several of the people. Um, they were at the tail end of their careers, but that, that were involved with the development of synthetic aperture radar at, at Goodyear Aerospace, which was now which is now Lockheed Martin management and data systems. Um, 
so that was that was pretty neat. That was um, you know it's it's always um, it's it's always very neat to 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 talk to people and to be able to interact with people that were there. Um, and and so that was neat. The other the other really um, um, fun thing about the project was um, a FOIA release to um, San Diego National Laboratories, which helped um, which helped me figure out why Motorola, what were some of the early, earlier, early, earliest projects that Motorola worked on. And, and Motorola, um, you know, had, had, had come to Arizona in 1949. They said it was because of the weather and, and this and that, and they had forgotten or, or the people that, you know, were there um, in the nineties did not realize that the reason that Motorola really came to Phoenix was because of connections to Sandy and National Laboratories and work on atomic weapons. And I was able to figure that out through some FOIA requests. And so that was pretty rewarding as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we have a question from uh, Stephanie. Uh, did you come across any stories of boom towns in this process or how was small town development impacted by the Cold War facilities? That's a great question. Um, so again, you know, it, this was maybe predominantly an urban, uh, an urban um, issue. It was Phoenix. It was, um, it was Tucson. Um, one of the things that was very interesting was a lot of the smaller Arizona communities were lobbying or trying to lobby to get, to get their defense plant or to get a, a company um, to come. Um, but but most of most of the companies the, the companies like which became Allied Signal and Honeywell Motorola General Electric's had a computing facility um, in Phoenix um, uh, Hughes Aircraft they they wanted they needed to be close to Air Links because they were sending their products out via through through airplanes at airports so it 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 was mainly um, you know Phoenix and Tucson that they that they were were really around. Now there were there were um, companies um, that started to uh, move in around Fort Huachuca that helped kind of serve that military base. Um, but again, it it not so much in some of the other areas. Great. Okay, we just got another question in. Um, so did companies like Motorola show any awareness that locating their plants in residential neighborhoods would result in groundwater contamination, uh, a Superfund site or significant health problems for people growing up there that persist to this day? Yeah, um, unfortunately they did not. Um, they, Motorola was very proud. I, I've seen a lot, I, I was able to do work at the Motorola Museum as part of this, as part of the, um, project when, when I was working on it. And um, they thought it was the best thing. They thought it was a way to, um, you know, to, to be part of the community, to um, have, a, have a, 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 a area that was beautified and, and um, Motorola, especially, especially the early plants, they were very, uh, very cognizant of um, architecture and, um, and and everything and and there was there, it, it it did not cross their mind. There was there was no um, realization that um, various solvents that they might have now might have used then would get into groundwater contamination. Great question. Uh, all right, thank you, Jason. Uh, so we have another question. Uh, was there any strategic reason for the Navy's boneyard in Goodyear to be moved to the Air Force boneyard in Tucson? You know, um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I know that it did move. I'm not really sure why it did. It, it could have just been, um, it could have just been because, you know, they needed to, they wanted the space for something else. I don't think there was actually a strategic reason um, other than maybe they had just, you know, they, it wasn't needed anymore. They were just looking to, to move together, you know, two, two very different types of operations. All right, great. Yeah, these are these are great questions. Keep them coming, folks, if you have them. Uh, we have another one. Uh, 
I'm curious if you have ever come across any indications that the Soviets were aware of the importance extent of the defense manufacturing industry in Arizona, perhaps from a targeting list, for instance. Yeah, they were. Um, um, so um, uh, the uh, Soviets were uh, the Soviets were one of the um, were were experts at carto cartography. They made maps of the entire world. Um, their map collections still exist. The Library of Congress has some of them that they obtained after the end of the Cold War. Um, there were maps prepared of Phoenix and Tucson, very detailed level. Um, I've seen them. I was able to see some of them. Um, you can now actually buy some of them online at, at, um, someplace. And um, the, the manufacturing facilities are listed. Um, you know, the Soviets um, um, certainly knew what was being done and the significance of these, of these facilities. Whether, you know, they probably did not know what specifically was being manufactured. Certainly the development, development of synthetic aperture radar, they probably did not know that was being developed there. Um, but certainly um, they understood that, you know, there were key plants um, and, and that, you know, um, they were there and they would have been targeted. I mean, the, the people that um, protested about Tucson being ringed by Titans, I mean, the, both Phoenix and both Tucson were certainly on, on the list that those Soviets kept if war ever came. That'd be, that'd be fascinating to, to, uh, to get into some Russian archives and, and uh, if you could read Russian and, and uh, find out what they were saying about Arizona, yeah. Um, all right, another question. Uh, did you say that Motorola had a small presence in Vail, Arizona, or uh, did did uh, did she mishear that? No, they did. They did. Um, and again, I, I I I you know it's it. I don't know exactly what was done there, but there was. They did have a small presence there. Um, there was also a lodge, a corporate lodge there, but they also, also did some, some small um, batch manufacturing there, although I, I can't tell you exactly what, what was done then. All right, great. Um, uh, what role, if any, was played by the Yuma Proving Ground and or Yuma Marine Corps Air Station? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely quite a lot. Um, so the Proving Ground, Yuma Proving Ground was, um, enormously important to the defense industry in Arizona. Um, uh, a lot of, just a lot of um, different um, weapon systems were, were proved there um, over, over, the, over the years. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the Marine Corps station um, and the proving grounds were, were quite important and still are, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, that's all the questions we have in the chat. We have we probably have time for a, a handful uh, more questions. If anybody has any uh, has any others, um, I, I have one. I, I grew up in the in the South, and I don't so I don't know if you could if you could answer this. Um, uh, but just sort of a, a big picture question of of how does uh, how does uh, Arizona specifically or the West um, in a larger sense how does that compare to the South in terms of uh, federal defense spending uh, during the Cold War. Uh, um, I know a lot of money went, went, went to the South. Um, could, could, do you have a sense of how the West compares? Yeah, certainly the, the most money um, was California and um, the East Coast, um, New York, Massachusetts. Um, and then it's kind of trickled out other places. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that um, the defense companies understood was that when you create a weapon system, you want to make sure that it's made component parts, component systems are made in various congressional districts. Um, so you have a missile, the rocket is made in Seattle, the airframe is in uh, Georgia, the guidance system is in New York. Um, and that's one of the ways you make sure your program isn't cut um, because it puts people out of work, you know, at the various plants. I would say that, um, you know, comparing and contrasting, I think certainly Texas, Arizona, you know, they're the key areas in the Intermountain West or the West. Um, 
Um, and they were the, the drive really there is dispersion and decentralization. I think in, in California, it's the educational institution um, that helps create um, the Stanford Industrial Park, obviously. Um, but then also, you know, in Seattle, um, you know, that that's becomes important as well. So there's, you know, there's various reasons why some places, why people go various places. Certainly, um, um, the defense industry certainly pushed um, a lot of these companies to Arizona and other Western, Western areas. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's a, a fascinating history. Um, looks like we have, uh, yeah, we have another question. Uh, you mentioned two Nike missile sites. Uh, were there only two established in the state or were there other sites as well to provide air defense for vital industry? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't know offhand. I, I certainly, there were two. They, they um, you know, as different systems were introduced, they changed. Um, um, so Arizona was part of the SAGE, the um, SAGE system, which was kind of a, a also a radar system that helped, uh, helped with the early warning of essentially Soviet bombers. Um, I, I believe there were. I, I would be. I would not be surprised if there were. Not, there, if there were not more than two, there was also ICBM um, um, uh, facility sites also in Arizona as well. So. All right. Well, we're just at about time. So um, uh, thank you, Jason. And this was this was great. And um, I loved I loved working with you. I thought your article was fantastic. And so it's it's a, it was really nice for you to to come out tonight and talk a little bit more uh, about it with us. So, so thank you. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you, David. And just, yeah, I, I want to double down on that. And thank you so much. I, I learned a lot. So I've been taking notes your whole talk. That's when my camera's been off. So I really appreciate your research. Um, and I just want to thank you all for joining us on this talk. Um, if you feel like you missed anything or you want to rewatch, we'll have a recording up sometime next week. And um, feel free to reach out with uh, any additional questions that we didn't get to, and we'll we'll happily pass them on and try to get an information uh, or answers for you. But thank you so much, and don't for yeah, don't forget to check check out his article in the Arizona uh, Journal. So um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much for attending. Have a great night, everybody. <laughs>